few words from William Baldwin Cantello, who is a director of Nature Based Solutions at the World Wildlife Fund in the UK. And um, maybe there might be a little bit of crossover with some of the issues we've just talked about there in our uh, in our uh, in our last panel discussion. But uh, William, it's over to you. So, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Will Baldwin Cantello. I'm the director of Nature Based Solutions at WWF UK. Um, which means that I um, I focus on delivering two partnerships um, for our organisation. One is with uh, HSBC and the World Resources Institute, which is called the Climate Solutions Partnership and has um, four main pillars, one on, on accelerating the delivery of nature-based solutions and finance for nature-based solutions, another on the energy transition in Asia, uh, a fourth, a, th a third, sorry, on, on um, innovative business models um, for a low carbon future and the, the, the fourth on sustainable palm oil. But what I'm going to focus on today is particularly our thinking in the second partnership, which is Trillion Trees, which is a partnership that WWF has with the Wildlife Conservation Society and BirdLife International. So I, I've been asked to give you um, something that uh, uh, something motivational uh, for you this morning and, and something honing in on, on forests. And I don't know what motivates you, but I thought I would share something of what motivates me and, and hopefully we'll overlap somewhere in the middle. And actually, to, to start with that, I'm going to uh, read you a letter. And it's actually a letter that I hope to receive one day. Um, so we'll start with that and then, then I'll go into some more specifics around the situation with forests at the moment. And the letter begins, uh, Dear Grandad, all week at school this week, we had, a special, we had special lessons on forests and trees. I found out that 40 years ago, forests were being cut down in lots of different countries around the world. I couldn't believe it. And that tigers and elephants and lots of other forest animals were endangered as well. I'm so glad we managed to stop that. I love trees and I really look forward to playing in the woods near our house at the weekends. I can't imagine a world where we might have lost them all. My history teacher told us that a turning point was in 2015 when there were big agreements made in the UN to protect forests and other ecosystems. Lots of governments and businesses promised to stop deforestation completely by 2020 in a long list of global goals. I can't remember all of those goals, but one of the other ones was to make sure that no one anywhere lived in poverty by 2030. I guess we must have met that goal too, because I was shocked to hear that some people in poorer parts of the world used to go hungry or couldn't go to school. We're going to learn more about that next term, but I couldn't believe we waited until 2030 to change that. A few years later, in 2021, we had missed some of those goals, but new agreements on climate change and nature were made by world leaders of governments and businesses, and it really spurred on action. Everyone started changing the way they did things at work and home. And it must have been so much work to deliver on those UN goals, but I'm so glad we did it. My teacher said that one of the big reasons people started really doing things about forests was to reduce climate change due to emissions of greenhouse gases from deforestation. Although most of those gases come from burning fossil fuels, a lot also came from burning or cutting down forests. I also couldn't believe people used to put oil in their cars. The air must have been filthy. I've read a lot about how climate change is affecting us now, but it's scary to think how much worse it could have been. My science teacher told me that one of the reasons we have a stable climate now is not only because we stopped cutting down trees, but we also started regrowing lots of them all around the world. Scientists think that about 10,000 years ago, there were 6 trillion trees in the world. Apparently, when you were younger, there was only about 3 trillion, and 10 billion were lost every year. And now we are counting up towards 4 trillion. In my home economics class, I've learned that one of the big breakthroughs seems to have been the change in diet everyone made, and discovering a new way of growing enough protein for everyone. This was important because most deforestation happened for farmland. We used to eat much more meat, and that needed lots of land, so forests were cleared to make way. And we all have a much healthier diet now. And lots of food companies that use things like palm oil and soy and bread or ice cream or whatever it was really cleaned up their act. The other big thing that helped was stopping illegal wood and paper being sold and used. People weren't even recycling all their paper back then. Why was illegal logging even happening in the first place? I couldn't understand that. Why didn't that get stopped sooner? My history teacher said that in some countries there was a lot of poverty, meaning that, that people saw logging as a way to earn money and there were difficulties enforcing laws in remote places. It took a, a range of new laws and lots of fair trade deals between countries to eventually solve the problem. 
In geography, I even heard that at the same time as those global agreements were made in Britain, there were more trees being cut down than planted, even though we had much less forest than we used to. The UK used to be three quarters forest a few hundred years ago. Thankfully, we protected and expanded some of our forests again. Things changed when lots of people signed up to a charter for trees, woods and people in 2017. My teacher said that numbers of red squirrel and pine martins are much higher now, deer numbers are lower, and there weren't even any links in the UK 40 years ago. The woods must have been almost empty. I learned about the amazing Amazon in science class too, and about orangutan and their forests in Borneo. With all the medicines we've got from those forests over the last 40 years, we're so lucky these areas were protected. And Brazil and Indonesia have just been ranked as two of the best places to live in the world, according to a new survey. Mum said that if we save up the carbon budget, we can go on holiday to one of them next year. Anyway, I wanted to write and say thanks for doing what you, what you and everyone in your generation did to help us save our trees and forests. Life wouldn't be the same without them. So I first published that letter as a blog a few years ago when my daughter was born, and I've since had a son as well. And um, I've made a few minor updates for today to bring it up to date, but actually really much of it still holds true. And that is the future that we could create and the changes that we could bring about in the next few decades. So having painted a bit of a picture, I'm going to go through some more of the technicalities, at least as we understand them today. So first, I'm going to start with the what. And that is, what are we trying to achieve? And as referred to a little bit in that letter that I just read through, there's broad consensus on these three objectives, at least. And these are taken from a voluntary agreement called the New York Declaration of Forests, but I think are widely accepted and, um, by almost all governments and businesses and organizations like WWF. And the first is that we need to end natural forest loss by 2030 at the latest. We need to remove deforestation from agricultural commodity supply chains. It was by 2020, and we'll, in a moment, look at how far we got towards that. And we need to go further and put 350 million hectares of forests and landscapes into restoration by 2030 and continue that trend thereafter. So if that's the headline on the what, um, let's go into a little bit more detail on that. So we could, we could put that that goal uh, a different way and we could describe it as bending the curve on forests uh, forest from forest loss to forest gain and shifting from a deforestation economy to a regeneration economy and as i mentioned at the start wwf is part of a joint venture with the wildlife conservation society and birdlife international that shares a vision of a trillion trees being better protected safe from lost and restored around the world and that essentially is a vision that encapsulates this this change this bending of the curve. So this change from inc increasing lost forest to increasingly gained forest, and that will require those three things: it's protecting forests that are at risk of deforestation or or, um, or degradation in future. It's also, it's working right at the frontiers of deforestation to prevent it happening, and it's restoring forests at scale. So um, let me just move on to the deforestation part, particularly. And what it will take will we'll be addressing deforestation in its particular deforestation fronts around the world. And the WWF identified 24 of these in our research last year. This is where um, deforestation mostly occurs across the tropics. And just in these 24 fronts, we lost over 43 million hectares. That's an area roughly the size of Morocco between 2004 and 2017. So this provides a real focus for our efforts on deforestation. But let's think about restoration for a minute as well. And I, there were some interesting comments earlier in the, in the last panel about whether we really can expand forests at scale in the way that it's being talked about. And I think the science is quite clear on this. Uh, there is debate about the precise number and there is, of course, very important social impl implications about how you decide where to restore forests and how you do that and how you engage with um, local communities and, and decision makers. But on the face of it, the physical science shows that there is space for a significant expansion of forests. And that's a mix of closed canopy forests, but also just more trees on farms, more trees in our cities and other multi-use landscapes. And a lot of that land that, that is uh, reported to be available is currently degraded. And so we have an opportunity to restore that land um, as part of this process. 
So if that's the what, let's think a little bit about the how. Sorry, let's think about the why. Why would we really pursue that ambitious goal? And the first thing I think I would like to say is that as a global community, we face a triple challenge over the next half a century. We need to keep global temp temperature rise to well below two degrees, aiming for 1.5 degrees temperature rise limit. And we need to resource the reverse the losses in biodiversity that have occurred over the last decades and centuries. And we need to meet the needs of roughly 10 billion people by the middle of the century. Most notably, I would say, in terms of them having access to enough healthy food. So each of these objectives poses a tremendous challenge, but together they form a triple challenge. And that's because they're completely interdependent. Achieving one requires the other two, and failing at one means failing at them all. So we need to think about them in an integrated way. And forests are a really good example of this. Just to expand on that a little bit, to, to meet our climate goals, we need to end deforestation because deforestation causes around 10% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. And as we said, we need to expand forest cover. And I'll explain a little bit more about the role that plays in scenarios for 1.5 in a moment. If we do this right, we will also deliver on our biodiversity goals because natural forests are so integral to our, uh, the natural world. But at the moment, many of the current national plans on restoration focus on plantation forestry, which has a limited biodiversity value and also a more limited carbon value as we harvest that timber over time. So we need to be restoring more natural forests as well. But how do we meet our food goals with shrink shrinking land available for farming? Well, actually, this is entirely possible if we adopt, adopt three particular measures. First, if we cut out food loss and waste, and around a third of the food we produced is wasted globally. If we shift to regenerative and other sustainable farming practices. And if we adopt healthy diets, which, of course, has the win-wind from a health point of view. So we will, of course, need to better just distribute food around the world, but actually there's no question we can produce enough of it. And in fact, we already do produce enough for that population size. So if I can just dive into these in a little bit more detail, let's think about forest and climate change. And these four graphs are ones you may be familiar with from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and their specific report on delivering a 1.5 degree temperature rise limit. And you can see the brown area in these graphs is, is what represents a follow. For those who aren't familiar with a follow, it's essentially forests and farming. And you can see that at the moment it's a source of emissions, but in three of those scenarios, it, it, it needs to reverse to a sink of emissions, so drawing down um, carbon from the atmosphere. The fourth example doesn't have that trend, but it does reply, require a huge dependence on BEX, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, which is that yellow area. And I think the expansion of BEX at that scale would fail the triple challenge test. And for that reason, I rule it out in this consideration. So if that's the role of forests in climate change, let's think about the role of forests in meeting our needs to the, in the future. And this chart, which I don't think you'll be able to read right now, but perhaps you will in the materials as it's sent around, just illustrates the importance of forests in delivering all of the 17 sustainable development goals. And therefore, securing their future helps us meet our needs in future, whether that's their role even in providing sustainable paper for school books to those who don't have any school books now, or their role in supporting our mental well-being as those of us who live in cities find ourselves more stressed and anxious and tired. Um, being, time, being in nature is an important part of our response to that. And then the role of forests in reversing losses of biodiversity. And you can see here in this graph that the loss of forests over the last three decades, four decades, has led to a decline in wildlife. And specifically, those species that only live in forests, their population size has more than halved since 1970 on average. And this is significant, you know, if we all care about biodiversity, this is significant in and of itself, but it's also significant for two other reasons. One is that the wildlife that live in forests are completely integral to their ability to store carbon in the long term. And that's particularly important for primates and large birds, who are the ones that distribute the large seeds that lead to the largest trees, which store the most carbon. And if we lose those species over time, that forest becomes less carbon dense. And that is invisible to, to satellites, but it's a trend that we're seeing around the world. And the loss of nature also threatens our economy. 
and I'm thinking beyond forest now, but to all, all the loss of biodiversity. And, and it's a risk that's obvious when you consider that, according to the World Economic Forum, more than half the world's economic output, so around $44 trillion of economic value generation, is highly or moderately dependent on nature. And of course, the World Economic Forum also, in its Global Risk Report, found that four of the top five risks facing the world in the coming year were linked to the environment, one of those being biodiversity loss. And according to a modelling that we have done ourselves with, with other experts with in, on trade models, it's found that the continued loss of biodiversity at its current rate would lead to the, lo the loss of services we benefit from that would have a total economic impact of nearly $10 trillion in loss by 2050. And specifically, that, that would have um, price hikes for commodities like oil seeds, fruit and vegetables, which of course affects us all, but the poorest the most. So that's that's the why we need to be um, delivering on a, on a positive forest future. Let's think about the how. And I'm just going to start particularly thinking about deforestation in supply chains of agricultural commodities. And we need to be delivering on this as a real urgent priority. This is this is where most of the deforestation um, comes from. And this graphic here is, is also from research that we've done with others in the last year. And um, it shows how far we've got towards that promise to remove deforestation from agricultural supply chains by 2020, the one I mentioned at the start. And if I were to just summarize this graphic, I'd, I'd summarize it as this. The half the companies that should have a deforestation free commitment do have one. Half of those with a commitment report on progress and half of those who report on progress, um, and sorry, of those who, who report on progress, we've got about halfway there on average. And I think it's fair to say that we just can't deal in halves anymore. The stakes are too high and um, the timeline is too urgent. So we need to go much further and faster on that. But even when we do that, international supply chains are only part of the solution and, and deforestation is a complex problem. And so the solutions are complex too. This, this graphic illustrates that um, in, in both the way it's driven and also the way that deforestation could be solved. And some will argue that actually we can't end deforestation. We've been campaigning on this for decades, um, WWF particularly, and we've had you know, billions of pounds and dollars of public finance invested, and we've had lots of voluntary corporate commitments. So perhaps there is a, there's a school of thought that we just can't deliver on it. But there is proof otherwise, I would argue. And if we take Brazil, where deforestation is most, most significant at the moment, actually between 2004 and 2012, deforestation was reduced by three quarters and was continuing downwards at that point. But the biggest reduction in greenhouse, it, that was the biggest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that any country had ever achieved. And it got there because it took a comprehensive response. It was combining law enforcement to prevent illegal logging and illegal deforestation alongside hard measures like protected areas, including putting more um, forests in the hands of indigenous peoples. It used public finance incentives through rural, tying rural credit to deforestation rates at the municipal level. And it included private sector commitments, including a moratorium on, the, on deforestation in the Amazon for soil production. And there were other aspects besides, but it was really combining these multiple things together that led to success. But unfortunately, that, that success was vulnerable to political change because it was also expensive on the public purse because alternative economic sectors were not developed. So once, once it was given a chance to, soy and cattle expanded again at the expense of forests. And I haven't got um, a graphic to demonstrate this, but I think it's also worth highlighting that, that the expansion of forests at scale is also possible. And I think I would, I, I would use an example from our Trillion Trees work to highlight this. We wanted to look at the feasibility of restoring forests at scale, and there are many ways to restore forests, but enabling natural regeneration of forests is the cheapest way to do it and it has the greatest carbon and biodiversity benefits. So we set about finding out where forests were regenerating around the world. And we found that nearly 59 million hectares of forests, that's an area larger than mainland France, had regrown since 2000 after the you know, following deforestation before that period. And this was found in places as diverse as Mongolia, Brazil, and Gabon. And this area of forest had the potential if it was allowed to reach maturity, it would lock up the equivalent of 5.9 gigatons of CO2. That's more than the annual emissions of the United States. So this is a national, natural force that we can build on. But it's also important to remember that this is just a fraction, actually, of the forests that are lost through deforestation every year. We lose around 
10 million hectares every year on average. Um, and young forests have less biodiversity and carbon value than old forests. So these two are not a straight swap, but we do need both ending deforestation and regenerating forests. So if we think about um, uh, the other reasons why we, we haven't necessarily delivered on deforestation so far, I think it's well established that one of the central reasons we've not cracked deforestation, despite the policy campaigning and public funds invested that I've mentioned, is that grey finance for agriculture and other drivers of deforestation still vastly outweighs the green finance. And this is where you and, and, and the rest of the finance sector might come in. What I've presented so far suggests that there are three avenues for you and your businesses to play a role. First is engagement, and I think this was already mentioned earlier today. Finance sector has a really important role to play in leveraging companies into making commitments and to reporting on them. And of course, as a result of that, being able to um, hold them to account on delivering on those commitments. And that's pushing for deforestation free, not just certified sustainable and not just no illegal deforestation. And there was some mention earlier about the divestment versus engagement discussion. And divestment will be a less effective strategy on deforestation. It's more relevant to the fossil fuel debate, but when we think about the commodities involved, we're talking about soy, palm oil, timber, and all of those have a really important role to play in a sustainable future if they're produced in a different way and consumed in a sustainable way. So we still need those commodities. The second thing, second role you can play is, is on using your network effects. It will take significant policy shifts and on the ground action to deliver a deforestation, sorry, to, to move from a deforestation economy to a regeneration economy. So how can you lend your voice in support of policies that shift the real economy to deforestation free? One of those opportunities at the moment in the UK is through the Environment Bill. There is the possibility um, and the probability, I would say, of um, companies trading and using forestry commodities, having a mandatory due diligence obligation placed on them to um, ensure they are not contributing to deforestation. And we need all the voices we can to help us get that over the line. And that, in turn, I hope would help you in delivering your own commitments because you would have that, that, that due diligence in the real economy. And the third thing, of course, is about investing in nature and the transition towards uh, a nature positive, a forest positive future. We've talked a lot about that this morning. And there's a small but growing pipeline of investable propositions for forest protection and restoration, often under the banner of nature-based solutions. And we're working hard to enable this market to grow. That's where our partnership with HSBC and WRI, the World Resources Institute, come in, where we've developed a nature-based solutions accelerator that's both trying to take a pipeline of projects through to investment readiness, as well as try and under, un, um, understand and address some of the systemic barriers that's preventing that market from growing at scale. And we'd love to, to talk to and work with anyone who's interested in that space as well. So that comes to, brings me to the end of what I wanted to say this morning. And um, I guess my question to you is whether you feel motivated or more motivated than you did this morning. And I hope that's the case. Um, but I'd also love to hear your questions and comments. I think we have um, five or 10 minutes now where we can do that. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, William. That, that was uh, that was very good. Thank you. Uh, you said some quite interesting points there. Uh, interesting that three quarters of the UK was once covered in forest. It's, um, it's, but um, I actually took a trip to Wadi Rum in Jordan and I was standing in the desert and nothing but sand for miles, as far as I could see. And my tour guide said that where we were standing 100 years ago was a forest. And um, that Lawrence of Arabia used to hide his guns in there. And it was just desert now. So it's... Uh, it's interesting how these things can change in, I suppose, 100 years. I mean, it, it's more than the human lifestyle, but it is still quite a, a short time period in, in the grand scheme of things, isn't it? It is, and, and I, I think that that's where we have a, a shifting baseline understanding of what is a normal amount of forest to be on our planet, which leads to questions about whether we really can deliver on, on this future. But uh, the other um, slightly worrying trend, but has opportunities as well, is that some of those dry landscapes you've mentioned, and even you know, on the edge of the Arctic Circle, some of those landscapes due to climate change are becoming more um, uh, uh, more suited to tree cover. And so one of those areas where we were seeing um, trees returning and, and growing um, naturally in that study I mentioned was actually in Greenland, which surprised us, um, but also is a sign of how, uh, how our climate is already affecting the landscapes around us. That's for sure. A question from the floor here. Um, what would you like, what practical steps would you like to see institutional investors, asset owners 
to do to protect forests for future generations? Well, I think those three three things I mentioned at the end are um, are the big categories of action. I think you know it's really about seeing both risk and opportunity here. So how do we you know it's it's about engaging with those that you have invested in or your client space and asking the questions around what they're doing to ensure they're not associated with deforestation, building that into your policies. And I think what's really important at the moment is that we've seen at the company end. Um, a really significant and useful shift away from just thinking about illegal deforestation and to thinking about deforestation at all. And it's actually one of the things that we hear from the government is they think it's easier or more pragmatic to be ruling out illegal deforestation. But it's actually easier from your point of view to be monitoring any kind of deforestation because the question of what is legal and illegal can be a real mess in many forest countries. But actually, we have the kind of data available from through satellite imagery to be able to tell you where deforestation has happened or not happened. So there is a really progressive move there, and it's only by tackling deforestation, whether it's illegal or illegal, that we'll be able to deliver on that climate future. Um, and I think then the other things are, you know, it's really about being willing to speak up, lend your voice, and and seeking those opportunities to expand your, your investment portfolio in nature. And, and uh, I know there's some work to be done to make that a more attractive and secure proposition. Um, whether that's about better metrics, so better reporting to, to demonstrate that impact, or um, shifting some of the, the perverse public incentives that, that prevent that. And so we're, we're working on some of those and, and keen to work with others as well. Great, great. You did mention there about the restoration goal by 2030, nine years away. Do you think we're going to hit that? I would say at the moment um, we're not on course, but there is a tremendous amount of work that's growing now through the... Um, we just launched a UN decade on ecological restoration, which I think some of you may have had some awareness and engagement with UN decades in the past, and often they've been very ineffective at driving action. But I've actually been very impressed at the way this one has been organised. And there's a huge amount of involvement from the private sector as well, including the likes of the World Economic Forum. So I'm optimistic that we can really, really drive challenge, I think, and um, drive progress. I think the growth, if we get it right, and I think there's some valid comments this morning about the way the carbon market is is not robust at the moment. But if we use that that well and we just set it right, then I think that will drive a huge amount of action in the next nine years. And we're not going to have everything restored by 2030, but the important thing is that, that landscapes are in the process of restoration because it will take decades. And we need to start now if we're going to reap the benefits in terms of carbon removal by 2050. Uh, we've got a question from Charles Pringle. Um, he would like to know, I mean, what is the easiest win? What's the low hanging fruit here in terms of reforestation and well, I think uh, natural regeneration is the low-hanging fruit for, for us. That that was why we focused in on that. There are there are landscapes where the natural demographic trends have led to the abandonment of farmland. For example, Eastern Europe, um, Central America, um, parts of South America as well. And so the opportunity there is to to support and secure that regrowth of forests on that former farmland that naturally fits with the direction that that economy is going in. And it always becomes harder and tougher when you're trying to shift the economy to enable restoration. So uh, uh, honing in on those hotspots of regeneration, and finding ways to secure that into the future, that's that's the quick win. Um, and then we have the slightly harder task of active restoration in landscapes that have been degraded significantly through um, intensive agriculture or desertification over the decades. Uh, the world does seem to have had a sort of an awakening in terms of what they call the climate emergency. And this, of course, means many different things, everything from floods to, to, to rising temperatures and, and the damage to wildlife, of course. Do you think this is helping the reforestation bid? It is helping, I would say. I think um, it's made it less of a environmental issue and more of a social and an economic issue. But it comes with a risk as well. And I think the thing, one of the things that we are most concerned about in Trillion Trees is the um, focus on quick wins and investment in tree planting around the world. And the problem is more complex than that. And I think there are some, just like the carbon market in what you might call the kind of tree planting market, I think there are some operators that are less robust and offer attractively cheap propositions, but where there is um, I would have a concern about the local engagement, the long-term sustainability and the monitoring of that. So that, that momentum and that excitement needs to um, 
can, you know, carry integrity of demand and supply in terms of forest restoration. And if it does, then it will be it will be a major catalyst for change. OK, William, that has been fantastic. Thank you very much for giving us your time and, and, and letting us know exactly what's going on in this area. It's very important, as we've said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.